Okay, hello everybody. Uh, today we got uh, Kudan an Open Lab seminar, um, one of the few last ones in this semester, with Nathan Schneider and actually Bikal, who um, suggested Nathan Schneider, who is um, a professor at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder. Um, and of course, we're all envious because we got snow here in Tallinn, but no mountains. Um, and he's also a member of metagoth.org, uh, which is a a uh, decentralized autonomous organization, if I understand well, um, in the area of meta-governance. And um, so the um, title that um, we have on the website is What Could Community Governance Feel Like? I've seen a slide of a different title, uh, which is great. Uh, one of the reasons why we are really interesting to uh, sort of listen to you and discuss with you uh, regarding these issues is that we are uh, sort of a project, research project funded by the European Commission uh, focusing on cultural data analytics. And so one could imagine there is, you know, sort of digital humanities, um, more mathy computational stuff, artificial intelligence, machine learning stuff going on in that direction. And then, of course, there is a lot of uh, the main areas where cultural analysis is more salient sort of from the other side in media industry, in aesthetics and artificial intelligence, but governance is typically something which is um, in these communities not so uh, um, and not so well discussed. And there is areas where this happens more and uh, where this happens less. Actually, we live in a country in Estonia where digital governance is really very advanced. Like I moved in from Texas where I spent, uh, you know, sort of eight years. And before that I was in Germany. Um, and um, that is sort of like I'm operating on a gradient. Uh, you spend ever less time to do, for example, your tax return. Um, here in Estonia, everything is happening with the national ID and lots of stuff is really, really very convenient, while at the same time having a base law slash constitution that is very inspired by sort of like, you know, what happened in Germany after World War II, inspired by Americans, uh, but sort of like preserving privacy and stuff like that. So there's a really interesting kind of um, uh, thing going on there, but at the same time, uh, if you look to the US, um, there is at the same time, you know, we all hear horrible things in the news about Ron Santos and people in Tennessee, but at the same time, people need to be aware there's a lot of grassroots movements and a lot of sort of legal innovation and a lot of innovation in the area of like, you know, sort of how you can use artificial intelligence for the human good and how sort of the human good can be kept uh, while having sort of like a machine learning and stuff going on, uh, where the US is very much all to the place to look at. So this is very much like um, Sean Oliver points out uh, from time to time, you know, why does he accept the US citizens while citizenship while Donald Trump is happening is because stuff like that is happening, but also a lot of really good stuff is happening. And I think what both of you are doing is really exemplary in that kind of direction. And so we're very, very, very happy to have both of you here to discuss and have you, Nathan, to sort of give a presentation of what you are doing, both in your research and in metagoff.org. So um, the stage is yours, take it away. We typically have a two hour time slot. So uh, the ideal is 40 minutes plus 80 minutes discussion, but you can talk the entire time. You can uh, stop after three minutes and say, let's have a discussion. Um, so it's basically, you can do whatever you want with these two hours and we try to sort of like make it worthwhile for you in the same way you make it worthwhile for us. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for, for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here and thank you for your flexibility on the, on the date. Um, I am, along with many of my country people, indeed very envious of your tax returns. Um, uh, but today I'm I'm going to turn toward digital governance in a really different key. And I'm really interested in how that um, that kind of different way of thinking about um, about digital governance reflects back um, from from your experience there. So I've really been looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to start with a, you know, reframe the question of governance a bit here um, toward the case of my, my mother's garden club. Um, you know, very, very small scale governance. Um, my, my mother 
uh, has retired and she uh, in the last few years was elected um, president of her of her garden club, which is a group of women in her neighborhood who like to garden and they meet and they talk about gardening and other things. Um, it is a um, uh, a kind of ordinary social organization like thousands and thousands and thousands all over the country and millions around the world. Um, uh, not really e extraordinary or unusual in any particular way, um, except in all the particularities that make any particular social association um, distinct and, and important. Um, and as she started telling me about what she was doing in her garden club and how she was carrying out her office as president, um, I started realizing something. I, I started realizing that the things that she was doing in this garden club were unavailable in the online spaces that I was in. At the time, for instance, I was dealing with a 500 person email list um, of people interested in cooperative startups. So people like ostensibly interested in democracy. And I realized that the kinds of things that the garden club was using to govern itself were totally unavailable on my email list or in any Facebook group I was in or on any subreddit um, that, uh, and, and in particular, I ran into a, a problem of the kind of usual internet troll on this email list, and I didn't have the governance tools to deal with it. Um, and it was kind of, it was kind of striking how just like the simple things that are part of any kind of civic association like her garden club were so unavailable that all I could do was as admin of the email list, step in and assert my authority. Um, eventually I, I ended up adopting a few tools uh, uh, to change this, but, but I realized that how much we, we don't include basic tools for governance in the default settings of online life. Um, whereas in the garden club, they had a bio, set of bylaws with things like term limits on officers, officers elected by membership. You know, my mother's my mother was elected uh, to to be president, and bylaws defining you know processes and and sanctions and you know what to do if things go wrong. Um, in any online space, I've had almost none of this. Um, generally, we experience something very different, and and, and this matters. This is about more than just a garden club and an email list, because that, that garden club is um, a, an example of what Alexis de Tocqueville noticed when he came, you know, the French aristocrat who came to the United States in the 1830s and observed early American democracy from the perspective of European monarchy um, and the French Revolution and everything else, and realized that, you know, one of the real critical things that make democracy possible is people experiencing it in their civic associations in everyday life. That you can't do democracy at a large scale unless people are, are practiced in the art of doing it at smaller scales. And so the fact that this garden club and its practices and its methods of organization and conflict resolution are not available in the online spaces I was in, including ones, again, ostensibly devoted to democracy, is kind of scary. Um, and I want to explore um, how we came to this situation and what it could mean and, um, and, and where we could go next. Um, I'm going to put on, because it's a relatively small group here, I'm going to put on the chat um, just in case anybody wants to stop me with a quick clarification or anything like that, feel free to just throw it in the um, in the chat. In online community spaces, um, we see a pattern, a pattern that actually kind of reflects the larger worlds, the political worlds turn in recent years toward increasing um, interest, uh, flirtation with dictatorships and authoritarian leaders. 
we've experienced this in, in my country and in many countries around the world. This is actually you know, reflected in the context of our online spaces. Founders have near absolute power um, in perpetuity. So if I start a, an email list, like I did with the, the one I mentioned before, I get to have absolute power over it as long as I want. There's no constraint on that. Authority flows exclusively from the top down. So at one point, for instance, I invited some other people to join as moderators of that email list. And, you know, I assigned them some moderation authority, but it all came from me. Um, and censorship and exile are the primary sanctions. So really the main thing we can do um, and, and that we, we we do do in online spaces when somebody um, doesn't that does something that we don't like is is censorship or exile. We kick them out, we ban them, we silence them. Um, you know the, the what has come to be called cancel culture is maybe only an extreme version of what happens every day in in online spaces and is is the primary method for for holding people um, accountable in some respect. So this pattern is something I've come to call implicit feudalism. <laughs> it's, it's a pattern latent in the available tools that we use in our online spaces. It's a pattern that's remarkably widespread. So whether we're talking again about a primitive email list system developed in the 1990s or the latest chat app or the latest um, uh, you know, social media platform, you know, Discord is the platform of the moment here in the U.S. because it was involved in the the, the leaks of, um, you know, um, materials about the Ukraine war. Um, but pick your platform and you'll see this kind of, um, this kind of pattern. Um, you know, it, I call it implicit because it's not an outright ideology. It's often not something that we claim. Um, it's not something that we um, are doing in, some, in many respects and in most cases intentionally. Um, it's nevertheless, it resembles this kind of cartoon version of a feudal order. Um, again, I'm using feudalism here in a very metaphorical sense. The language of feudalism, you know, feudalists never actually describe themselves as feudalists anyway. That was a term applied later. Um, it's always been kind of a cartoon term. Um, but what we're talking about here is little fiefdoms controlled in very hierarchical fashion from the top down. And along with feudalism, too, is a kind of commons that arises from the bottom up. You know, the, the, the life of the, um, of the common people. Um, but there is still this very rigid social order within which that life um, occurs. And, and the structure is kind of absolute. Now, you know, a lot of people in you know, a lot of the people who, who designed these kinds of systems of implicit feudalism have claimed the mantle of democracy. You know, a lot of the people who developed early internet systems and social networks talked a lot about democracy, um, uh, democratizing this, democratizing that. Um, and yet like some of the basic features of what we might expect from democracy systems that ascribe authority within commonly agreed upon rules and hold people in authority accountable to those they govern. But those are, are really missing, um, as well as the capacity to transfer that authority um, onto others. So, you know, for, for, the, for the media scholars out there, um, you know, what is implicit feudalism? Um, you know, there are a few different bits of language that, that um, might be useful. Um, you know, an important term in media studies is, and, and many other fields is affordance, you know, kind of like a feature, except it's more like the things people can do centering human agency a bit more. Um, is it an imagined affordance? Is it something that, you know, is in our minds? But again, it's it's often not intentional. And in, affordances need to be, need to be, need to have more direct human involvement. Um, and, and I would argue then that, that this implicit feudalism lurks in what the affordances lack. It's kind of, it's kind of in the, you know, on the shadow side um, of, um, of our online spaces. Um, but that doesn't mean it's, it's innocent. 
Um, and I think it's, it's useful to think of it also as a kind of dark pattern. Dark patterns uh, are, this is a concept that's arisen in user interface design among designers calling out designs that seem to drive users toward bad or, or, or toward behaviors that users don't actually want to be doing. So for instance, a website that has a default, you know, has the, has the, you know, sign me up for your newsletter thing by default, when probably most people there don't want to sign up for that newsletter. Um, a dark pattern is something that, that inclines us into certain kinds of behavior, and even imagination in this case, um, that we might not actually want for ourselves, but that the design nevertheless guides us into. So I want to tell a bit of a story about how we got here. I think this is a pattern that, that has its origins in the very earliest online spaces, in the very earliest um, social networks. So um, I'm gonna focus in particular on a kind of US-centric history. I think there's some really interesting um, counterexamples to this actually in, in European contexts as well as in Latin America and elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, please uh, in the discussion, I'd love to, to bring in some of those, those alternative uh, context, but given the dominance that Silicon Valley-based networks have come to have um, in in most parts of the world, um, I'm going to stress this this story. Um, so the earliest uh, online networks, even before the internet was formally established, was were, were BBS, it's bulletin board systems, where somebody would would have a server in their house, a computer in their house. Um, or in an office, and they would run a um, system on it that people could dial into using phone-based networking. And, um, and starting in the about the mid-70s, um, it started to become possible to run a community on these systems where people would dial into your computer, post something, read what others had posted, uh, leave, and, and whoever was running the computer could actually moderate and remove things and remove people. They were kind of the host of the party. And that was a metaphor that people often used who were organizing this. There's a really wonderful, very long documentary you can find online, BBS the documentary, with lots of testimonies from people who ran these systems. And over and over again, they describe this sense that you are the, um, you know, as the sysadmin, um, the, the, the person in charge of the, of the, the community, you had, you know, ultimate power over whatever happens there, um, and and it really ran along the logic again of having a get having guests at your home. Uh, you you are um, you know they're in your home. You are they're visiting you. Um, you know you're in charge of the rules. They have to play by your rules, um, and and so forth. And you can always pull the plug, right? So there is this kind of clear absolutism. In, in that control. And also it mirrored the, the, the structure of the operating systems of these computers. Uh, it mirrored how um, computers tended to delegate authority from one um, administrator out into, um, into other users. So this, this kind of feudal pattern formed with these early communities, which many people who built later social networks experienced and were involved in and got to know and become familiar with this logic that the, the structure of the online community is, is being a guest in somebody's home. So th this pattern just repeats itself over and over in early social networks. So for instance, Lambda Moo is a famous kind of online, it's called a, like a dungeon, um, a, a game where people, not really a game, like a space where people would pretend to be different characters and they would, um, it was all text-based, based, but there were different rooms you could move among and interactions you could have with others. There was a famous case of um, a virtual sexual assault in this context. And out of that arose um, an effort to make the, the community self-governing, to, to enable users to propose rules and to create, you know, ad adjudicate conflicts and things like this. But again, the logic of implicit feudalism took over. The Lambda Moo was hosted at Xerox Park, a famous corporate research lab in, in California. And um, 
And after a while, the engineers running it realized, hey, you know, ultimately we, the server is sitting in our lab. Um, we're responsible morally and legally. So maybe you can make some proposals, users, but ultimately we're in control. Um, and so they had this kind of wizard power uh, that enabled them to have veto control over, over that you know, limited self-governance. Um, you know, so already you see even people attempting to experiment with more democratic practices, kind of running into legal, regulatory, um, and technical issues. You know, Usenet, an important email list network, um, had some similar patterns. It ended up um, forming a kind of board, um, you know, much like many more democratic organizations, but still at the community level, it practiced this logic um, of feudalism. Same thing, you know, plays out in email lists, as, as I've mentioned, um, which became a really important early social space and, and one that that it has become particularly important because of the ways it is used to, email lists are used to manage projects. Um, uh, uh, again, even the you know, some of the most participatory ones. So the, I want to explore some of the ways in which this pattern has has played out in particular ways in the context of peer production, not just social spaces of people talking to each other, but also um, uh, uh, the much heralded democratic promise of open source software and um, things like Wikipedia, um, these mass collaboration um, activities. So for instance, um, the Linux project, right, um, was, um, uh, uh, you know, is kind of famous for exemplifying this, this logic. Linus Torvalds, the founder of Linux, um, uh, uh, is referred to as a BDFL, a benevolent dictator for life. Um, and, and you see how this arose um, through the tools. Um, Linux is primarily, um, uh, uh, for many years, organized through an email list, you know, where people could contribute improvements, and um, and and Linus Torvalds would would um, you know integrate the ones he wanted and and release the software. Um, and this again, in in a way, created a kind of um, inheritance where the the logic of the the permission structure of the email list becomes the the logic of the organization of the community itself and when when linus torvalds develops git the software that is you know now the most popular version control system for open source software development and and any software development um it actually interestingly doesn't have implicit feudalism built in but because of that it it kind of adopts whoever controls you know defers to whoever controls the email list and similarly you know, when Git gets folded into GitHub, the very popular Microsoft-owned um, platform, GitHub provides the implicit feudalism that Git was missing. It tells you who is the owner of a project. Um, it creates, recreates that um, that comp, that familiar hierarchical top-down structure of, of online life with very little wiggle room um, uh, in other directions. Now, there, there are some interesting cases of uh, it, it kind of counterexamples um, to some degree. Um, for instance, the Debian project, which is a, a version of a distribution of, of Linux, a very influential one, um, uh, is kind of a constitutional democracy. Um, people elect uh, uh, leaders and, and all this sorts of sort of thing. Um, and, um, and Wikipedia also has a kind of somewhat accessible governance structure where people can be elected to different roles um, in, in the volunteer communities. Um, but it's striking how, how much these particular projects had to bend over backwards in order to establish these democratic practices. They've had to build their own tools. Um, they've had to establish a lot of norms and a lot of documentation um, and, and a lot of challenges along the way. Um, you know. My lab, for instance, right now is working with the Wikimedia Foundation to rethink some of its structures of governance um, that have, in, in some cases, become pretty broken. 
Um, and also, if you download the Wiki, Wiki, Media Wiki software that Wikipedia runs on, um, none of that comes embedded. You don't get any tools for self-governance. Um, you get implicit feudalism. Whoever installs the software, you know, is the admin and has control. So this is a pattern that has replicated um, over and over. Um, it's something that we've seen um, again and again in um, in online spaces. Again, it, it repeats the logic of the systems we rely on themselves of how computer permission structures are organized. Um, and autocracy has also become, this feudalism has become a kind of payment for free moderation. So um, when you think of all the people who do free work for online platforms, moderating Facebook groups or subreddits or, or Discord channels or whatever, um, in some respects, the companies are paying them for their moderation labor with, um, with absolute power. Um, and, and this is a, you know, an interesting um, phenomenon because there was a time where companies experimented with actually paying these people with money, and they ran into some legal trouble um, around doing that. Uh, and so, so in some respects, um, paying people with power it ha has become a convenient solution. Uh, to the problem of, of outsourcing labor. Um, and, and we see this pattern also come to the structure of companies themselves. So for instance, the company now known as Meta has an unusual structure for um, you know, a, a publicly traded company of its kind um, in that Wall Street permitted Mark Zuckerberg, the founder, to retain a full controlling stake in the company when taking the company public. This is very unusual in the context of, of Wall Street. Um, and yet somehow the norm of, of kind of feudal control and founder um, uh, power is, is, is so embedded, has become so embedded culturally in the context of online spaces that, that he got away with it. Um, and, you know, and, and, Zuckerberg himself has been one of these people who talks about social networks as spaces for experimentation with, for instance, community governance. Um, and yet, in the lived experience, in the day-to-day -day experience of so many users on his platform, that is not actually what they get to do. So again, here's a kind of summary of the list of of defaults that appear here. Control over communities vested in an individual or a small group. Authority derives from founders and their successors. Opacity of decision-making um, and processes. This is something that we have a lot of evidence for about, you know, that how little transparency there is and how decisions get made um, among moderators and online spaces. Suppression of user voice as a basic privilege. Um, the the main tool available to people is either complaint or or departure, exit, um, and um, and if you know your feudal lord is not you know is doing something that you think is wrong, you know the the only recourse is not in the community itself. It's going upward to the pope to the to the to the platform itself. So I, I want to turn from the diagnosis to the question of what else could be done. What if we had more diversity in our governance structures? And and this is to stress that I'm not calling for replacing you know this pattern that we're also used to with um, with a single other alternative. I think actually we need far more, um, far more flexibility. Um, and capacity to reflect the the diversity of of our real lived traditions, habits, um, cultures of of self governance, um, and I think this diversity is is actually really valuable. Like for instance, I mentioned the Linux uh, operating system earlier and Debian. Um, they actually fit into an interesting ecosystem where Linux, the the um, benevolent dictatorship. Um, is built on by Debian, which is a much a slower, more bureaucratic republic. And then, you know, Ubuntu is a tech startup that kind of repackages what Debian does into a consumer-facing product. 
Um, and I think that's an interesting dynamic to have different levels of a tech stack governed in different ways. You know, Linux is really good at, you know, a kind of razor focus on, on the core of the system um, led by one person. Debian makes sure that Linux is supported, supported on, you know, virtually any kind of computer you can imagine. You know, when, when I'm trying to find a, you know, uh, a, a Linux, a version of Linux that will work on some broken old computer, Debian's the one you can always count on. Um, and then Ubuntu, again, makes it into a product, packages that, that vast bureaucracy for the market. You know, another way of thinking about this is not just in the stack, but actually through time. And this is a project that some of us in Madigov are, are working on right now around governance transitions in open source projects. Um, a, a case of this is Python, which is a, another longstanding open source software project that began with a benevolent dictatorship um, and over time transitioned into an elected board. Um, and, and actually, not quite over time, quite suddenly, when the benevolent dictator suddenly left, um, gave up, threw up his hands, and the community kind of scrambled to figure out how are we going to self-organize, how are we going to do this, and they explored lots of different options and settled on a particular model of an elected, um, an elected board. Um, but this kind of temporal change, I think, makes a lot of sense, that, that some projects really need to prove themselves and might need that kind of top-down authority at the beginning um, to prove themselves in the, in the, you know, to prove their value. But then once they do, and once people rely on them, maybe it makes more sense to shift over to something more accountable. Um, but there is so much more work to do. Um, and this is what, um, what those of us in this, in the Meta Governance Project um, have been, have been exploring. You know, how could we create um, an internet that is much more receptive to diverse creative forms of, of self-governance. So a few of the kinds of things that, that we have been doing over the last few years and what began as a small group of about you know, five people writing a paper together to um, now a, a Slack, um, uh, 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 what is it called? The Slack server thing um, with, um, with about 700 people. Um, means identifying the germs of democratic practice in existing communities. Just as in feudalism, again, there is so much bottom-up activity and creativity happening, democratic practice even within top-down technical structures. Um, what can we learn from what people are already doing? Um, how can we investigate the, you know, the, the ethical possibilities, the, the technical possibilities, um, of alternative regimes, what else is out there? Um, exploring the range of human self-governance for, for inspiration. And this is a, a project that I've been doing with um, Federica Caragatti at, um, at King's College, uh, London, uh, called Governance Archaeology, creating a framework for how we think about learning from the broader um, legacies of human self-governance long before the internet. And of course, um, uh, testing and devising um, novel techniques, and so in in Medigov and you know and 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 our our broader networks, you know there's a lot of this going on, and um, it's been really really fun um, doing this work over the last few years. And so I guess above all, I I hope to invite you into it. Um, one one project that I I started on early um, was this. Um, this this uh, a platform called Community Rule. It's at communityrule.info, and it's a um, a platform that invites users to design their own bylaws. So again, I was thinking of that Garden Club. It has very rigid, legal-sounding um, bylaws that you know probably an online community might find pretty stodgy. How can we make this kind of practice of making our rules explicit easier? So this is still very much a prototype, but it's a it's a tool you can you can play with um, to try to map out what kind of governance does your community need, um, and do that visually, clarify the visuals in writing, um, and um, and actually share what you do with with um, with the public in a in a public facing library. And we've had some wonderful cases of people actually 
learning things from others and they can fork uh, other people's um, rules and um, and and modify them for their for their own context. Um, in the, on the theoretical and ethical side, um, with Seth Fry, I um, developed this uh, concept of effective voice. Um, you know, clarifying the kind of thing that implicit feudalism doesn't allow, because people, of course, in online spaces do have voice. Um, they don't just have exit in that classic distinction of, of Albert Hirschman. Um, you know, they, they have the ability to make their voices heard, but we call that affective voice with an A, um, expressiveness, right? You can, you can complain, you can be loud, you can be annoying, um, but you don't have that, what we call effective voice, which is that, that ability to, you know, cast a vote that's binding, um, to, to, to do things that, that have real consequences, whether the people in power like it or not. Um, and, and I think that distinction is important for, for being able to distinguish different forms of, of you know, self-governance activity. Um, I've also been looking at policy strategies, thinking about what kind of public policy um, do we need? Um, and, and this is uh, summarized in a, a paper called Governable Spaces, um, drawing from feminist um, uh, thought in particular, um, uh, uh, starting from the, the famous essay by Joe Freeman, um, uh, uh, called the tyranny of structurelessness, and exploring how public policy has actually reinforced this logic of of implicit feudalism, uh, and so, for instance, has uh, uh, put liability responsibility on whoever is running this, the computer um, in a way that that really inhibits um, self governance in online spaces, and how we might design policy differently. Um, because it's not just the technical structures that have reinforced this logic, it's also the, the politics of, of liability. Um, along with this, uh, a, a project called Governable Stacks um, has uh, explored the question of how at the grassroots level, at the community level, um, communities might assemble um, tech stacks organized for, for self-governance, how they might think about um, their choices in relationship to technology to support more um, uh, opportunities um, for self-governance. One space that has been particularly um, important for me and for, for others in our community is, is in the context of blockchains and, and, and cryptocurrencies and this sort of stuff. Um, not because we love everything that's going on there or because we think it's going to save the world, um, uh, but because in some really important ways, it actually violates the rules, the laws of implicit feudalism um, in the sense that rather than having a server somewhere that is ultimately the arbiter of a platform, um, in, in the context of crypto, you know, something like a DAO, a de decentralized autonomous organization, or a, um, even a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is kind of self-governed by default. You know, the whole point of the thing is to have multiple actors who don't necessarily trust each other working together toward a common end to maintain a common system. And so actually, for the first time, we have technical infrastructures that are um, designed with the, at least the possibility of self-governance in mind. Um, and, um, and this has actually opened up, I think, really for the first time, a, a, an explosion of um, development around software projects, interfaces, other kinds of tools for supporting self-governance. Um, so there are a range of platforms now being developed to enable people to like manage their blockchain-based communities and to cast votes and to see what proposals are coming up and things like that. Um, and I think that that you know, outgrowth of interest in, in you know, the technologies of self-governance is just a reflection of the fact that, you know, the opportunity is, is here in, in an important new way. Again, this doesn't require assuming that it's going to lead toward better forms of governance or more democratic practice or anything like that. 
It just means that opportunity is there. The thing that really got us going in um, in in the meta governance project was this paper um, a group of us did um, called Modular Politics, um, and it articulates a framework for how to um, what kinds of things um, you know online spaces should have, what kinds of capacities they should have um, for, to enable. Um, diverse forms of self-governance. And so we we start the paper out with a kind of a, a set of four frames. Um, uh, 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 expressiveness, they have to be able to, the, it has to be able to express a lot of different kinds of governance practices. That's something our normal implicit feudal, feudal implicitly feudal systems really don't do. It's, you know, admin or nothing. Um, they need to be modular. So that so that um, ideas can be recombined, you know, small um, kind of units of governance practices like a vote can be combined with another system like a jury, um, and and linked in a symbol in a single system. Um, we also think about um, portability, so that systems designed for one kind of community can be moved over to another. That's, for instance, what that community rule platform enables by people publishing their rule sets and then enabling other communities to fork them and adapt them for themselves. And then finally, inter, um, interoperability. So enabling different communities, governance systems to talk to each other. Because um, governance is always, as the you know, theorist uh, Eleanor Ostrom put it, polycentric. Um, and it always involves multiple spaces. Um, out of this, um, you know, an implementation of this idea that I've been working on is um, it's called ModPol. Uh, it's a it's a game mod that fits into a you know it's currently being developed for a, a game called Mind Test, which is an open source Minecraft clone. Um, and we're trying to um, explore what it looks like to embed this kind of governance logic into into an online kind of proto metaverse type um, type game. So. Um, there's so, so much more going on um, in, in the MediGov community, and I invite you all to participate if you're, if you're interested. For instance, um, we have a project called DowStar, which is, um, uh, which is developing standards for um, DAOs, those blockchain-based networks. Um, and we're working with all the software platforms that people are using to build DAOs and helping them develop a kind of common set of primitives so that they can be more interoperable with each other um, and develop kind of shared governance tooling to, to, to meet those goals um, that we set out around modular politics. And it's been really exciting to see that project develop, how much enthusiasm there's been from the, the software developers um, to get these kinds of standards in place. Um, another project um, I'm focused on now is around attention economies, thinking about how do we manage interfaces if we are, in fact, um, uh, if we do have access to governance power in diverse ways in different online spaces we're part of, how do we be good citizens? How, what kinds of tools, interfaces, ways of thinking, organizational design do we need to recognize that that's a lot of demands on, on our attention, potentially? Um, another project has been exploring constitutions that are being developed in the context of Web3 and, and DAOs. Um, you know, another project that's just getting started now is around um, how we can attach more collective governance to some of the core protocols of the internet. Um, and, uh, and that one is, you know, is very ambitious, but in a way it's, it's kind of at the core of what we've been trying to do all along is recognize that, you know, that our technical infrastructures, they don't determine our, our political possibilities, but they do shape them in really important ways. And um, and, and then in some respects, like the, the possibility of democracy as a political project um, has something to do with the practice of democracy in everyday online life. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, there's um, uh, the, the um, paper that I've been speaking mainly from um, is out in New Media and Society. Um, I'm also working on a book, assembling a lot of these ideas into one place. Um, that uh, should be out early next year.
um, please feel free uh, uh, to, to join us at metagov.org. Um, you can join our Slack from there. Um, you're, uh, a great way to get started in the community is to attend our seminar, which is on Wednesdays, um, which is just talks. There's actually kind of a bare um, uh, schedule coming up. Um, uh, so we need to schedule some more, but um, but that's that's an entry point for many people. Above all, thank you so much. I look forward to discussing all this with you. Awesome. Um, can you hear us? This, yeah, excellent. Um, thank you very much for this really neat uh, overview. And um, the, the slides were deceivingly simple because there's uh, really a lot of thought and uh, discussion, I think, that went into this uh, sort of whole um, ecocosmos in a sense. And um, having having lived in a in a sort of rural neighborhood uh, in in Texas, a lot of the things that you're you know, the the points where you started out with the garden club really ring a large bell for me. Like there, and and I have a bunch of questions regarding this. And also at the end, what you said regarding modular structure, which uh, you used this word primitives, which is I think is a really really interesting concept because if you think about how the human body or any other organism is uh, controlled or interacts with other uh, organisms. It's very much um, via these kind of sort of pre-shaped um, or sort of um, aligned uh, kind of geometries of certain things that work or don't work. And so I think that is a really interesting one because um, in some sense, we see a lot of really misuse, I think, because it's possible. Right, so th that is one of the interesting things that we we not only see benevolent di dictators, we see exploiters um, in um, like Zuckerberg or Elon Musk very clearly sort of like play that game. And so that is sort of some really interesting thing. This is only happening because it's possible and because nobody took a look <laughs> that this is sort of something that um, can roll out. And that's how we ended up in a situation that awfully smells like the late 19th century, where you know you can get very, 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 very rich by exploiting other people. And the people now, you know, in the past, people would sit in their uh, sort of uh, you know over-occupied room somewhere in Berlin or whatever other city you choose. They worked hard for these factory owners, and there it was really clear that there is exploitation going on. But right now. If you sit at home and you sort of, I don't know, browse Twitter or browse, you know, interact with your not so bit of an uh, Discord moderator, uh, nobody sees what's happening. And so people can be locked into their little cubicle without other people seeing that there is exploitation going on. I think that is a really interesting thing. But I'm pretty sure there is other questions too. So um, um, everybody who, who has questions, raise your hand. Um, if you're reluctant, um, I can also start with the with the community garden thing, which I think um, is interesting. So let me do that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There's a there's a hand raised next to you. Ah, here, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't see it because it's very small in front of me. So, <laughs> Neela, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Amazing talk. Thank you so much. I I think it was kind of like. You made it really kind of like visible uh, certain things that I have been just trying to understand, but I know I kind of like it. It's uh, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, there are some people who say that democracy doesn't work. So uh, you know, unfortunately, this. Uh, so um, do you think that this? Uh, they think like that because. Um, because of these kind of like different online platforms uh, kind of like are not working democratically? Or do you think that there are actually in kind of like the in, in the ways that um, like democratic organizations work, some things that could be made work better? So what is the, uh, how, how would you respond to, to those uh, accusations and uh what do you think is is the problem there yeah it's a it's a great question and such an important challenge and you know if, you know you can always start with that question of what do you mean by work um but um 
But, you know, in some ways, this work was really motivated for me by some studies making precisely that claim. So Seth Fry, who I mentioned earlier, who is a collaborator and part of the Medigov community, um, is, uh, uh, did a study on Minecraft servers, right? And he, he looked at, you know, did a huge data set analysis, longitudinal data on these Minecraft servers run by kids um, and basically what plugins they were using and found, you know, found es essentially like democratic practice was very rare and, you know, very top-down rigid control was much, much more common and that larger communities ended up having more and more plugins used to control users. Um, and, um, it, you know, and I think that's a very, it's a very reasonable finding, um, particularly when you recognize that, like, usually these servers are created by an individual who's paying the bills and can pull the plug. Um, and so what I started getting interested in seeing that study is, wait, what is the range of possibilities that's not available in those spaces? And how is that shaping the outcome? Are, are we saying that, that democracy doesn't work because we are working within a context that is designed to kill it? Um, and I experienced that a lot. Like uh, most of my life in the, or the last decade and a half has been focused on supporting cooperative businesses um, last decade. Um, and, uh, you know, these are democratic businesses. So I work with tech startups that are trying to use democracy. And, you know, they are, they're up against a tremendous constraint, you know, in, um, in a tech culture that really privileges returns to investors. And they're just getting blasted away by these huge tech startups with gobs more money. <laughs> um, and so, is it really like, it, does that mean that democracy is not a better way to build a tech startup when the competition is just so completely unequal? Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, at moments where, for instance, in our history in the US, when the federal government has actually provided financing for cooperatives, for instance, to enable rural electrification in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, they were wildly successful. <laughs> Um, when we set up a framework for credit unions, democratically owned banks, um, they were wildly successful. Um, so, so in that experience working with democracy in the economy, what I found is that often when people are making that claim that democratic practice doesn't work, it's because there's something in the infrastructure that is systematically disabling it and preventing it. Um, it's not to say there aren't bad democratic practices. The other, the other thing to really stress in this is, is the recognition that there is no one democracy. You know, that, that this was something Tocqueville saw, um, and this is something that, um, that, you know, any democratic theorist worth their salt has recognized that, you know, Derrida talked about democracy is something to come always, you know, that democracy is always an ongoing process. And 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 we sh it, it's not a single set of forms, but it's a practice of ongoing development of of self governance, and that's really what we try to work toward. In you know, that's what the modular politics framework is all about. Not saying democracy should look like this. Instead, saying we need an infrastructure that would actually give us a real chance to let to try creative self governance. Um, this is what we would need in order to even begin to make that claim that democracy doesn't work. Um, unless we have this, we haven't really given it a shot. Super nice. We have a, a question from on the road. So there is uh, the main train line in Estonia is between Tallinn and Tartu, which uh, Hannah is uh, traveling on. And I, <laughs> as I know the line, it's pretty full right now. So she asked me to ask a question. So she's listening. Uh, there's actually three questions, and then um, I think B sort of like ask a question right after that. So, um, Anna asks, um, you mentioned Ostrom. Are her ideas being tested for these online participation models? If so, could you elaborate on this? Yeah. Um, so, on Ostrom, so Ostrom's work is deeply, deeply influential in the Medigov community. Um, and, uh, uh, so for instance, 
Seth, who I've mentioned a few times, is comes out of the Ostrom workshop in in Indiana um, and uh, has been teaching us all uh, about about Ostrom's ideas. One thing that uh, we've been exploring with the community rule project that I mentioned is actually redeveloping it through the lens of this framework that Ostrom developed near the end of her life called the Institutional Grammar, which is a formal framework for, for formally describing um, mm -hmm. governance systems. Um, and so we've been exploring the possibilities of, of using that as a, as a basis for, um, for developing these kinds of tools. We're not sure whether that mapping will, will work. Um, around, again, around these ideas of polycentricity, of recognizing that governance is always complex and is always multi-sided um, is another insight from her that's been really um, important to stress. Um, you know, also the centrality of culture. You know, a lot of the cases that Ostrom looked at were things that developed over many centuries and um, developed through processes that even their participants don't fully understand and um, and and are hard to ever you know fully know. They're just so built into people's muscle memory, and that mm -hmm. that recognition and honoring of of culture and inheritance is is a really important um, you know thing for me in in the governance archaeology project that I mentioned, as well as actually for instance in the design of Modpol, the the game mod, um, we use the logic of inheritance. So mm -hmm. when you create a group within a group, it inherits the rule set of the group it came from. That's one little nod to um, to Ostrom, that sense that, you know, governance is a long process and it builds on itself rather than the kind of Silicon Valley vision, which is when you press a button and start a new group, you have a blank slate and everything is new. Um, you know, I think Ostrom really, you know, resisted that idea that that anything is new, um, you know, that, that in fact, we, we inherit our, our cultures and, and habits of governance. So there are so many ways I, I often find myself actually having to like make rules to say, stop citing Ostrom because it's too much and she can't be right about everything. Um, and so <laughs> we try to, to, to look beyond her, but, but it's kind of embarrassing how much we, we draw from her and the broader network of people that she inspired. I, 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 there's there's an interesting side question stream I have in my head going on on databases, which uh, very much sort of like feeds into this. But I want to continue with other streams of stream of questions, which is more really governance governance related. So, would you say that the centrality of firms and liberal democracies and their private goals have led to this foilism? So, a systematic change in the real world regarding economic systems would be needed as well. Um, so more focus on other values, basically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, de definitely. I mean, there there is a clear resonance between the kind of feudal technical structures and the the needs of. I, I I'm assuming by firms there we mean like investor owned um, corporations. Um, uh, and and you know, as I mentioned, I've worked. For a long time on on um, cooperative businesses, and you know, ultimately, I think it's probably the case that in order for, to do governance in online spaces, you need to change the 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 underlying ownership structure of these online spaces um, mm -hmm. to govern something. You have to have power over it. To do democratic democratic governance, you have to have democratic ownership. Um, and I think there are some ways around that. You know. Often, for instance, contexts like Wikipedia, you know, which is controlled by a, you know, a foundation board, nevertheless, grants a lot of autonomy to the participants. And so there, there are ways around that in some contexts. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I could even imagine things like Reddit, you know, enabling a lot of government de democratic practice while retaining some ultimate authority. You know, for instance, in Wikipedia, they use the language um, of, of constitutional monarch. And I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting way in which mm -hmm. like companies could, you know, could retain their central control while enabling a lot of democratic practice. You know, mm -hmm. they could step in in extreme situations, but mm -hmm. still allow, you know, 90, 80, 90 percent of of, you know, decision making to be basically democratic and, and allow this kind of freer experimentation. So, 
I, you know, the, 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 the short answer is yes, ultimately. Um, but the longer answer is, you know, I don't, I think there's a lot that we can do in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So, so staying with this question, like you said, like it probably means larger sort of like companies that are under control of investors. So coming from Southern Germany, uh, sort of around Munich, Southern Baden-Württemberg, but also Northern Italy, Milan, tiny cities in, in, in Italy, you have this sort of like, you know, sort of culture of small medium enterprises where that are typically founded by uh, one, two, three people and then become sort of largish uh, with many workers. And in this sort of like time of social markets uh, capitalism, where you have sort of workers' rights, while at the same time, you also may have something like a democratic sort of like uh, employees, sort of parliament, whatever the English word for that is, for Betriebsrat, um, where you, you sort of have like sort of at the same time, some kind of democracy, but it's still sort of a controlled environment in the sense that the person who came up with the idea uh, sort of has some sort of, um, you know, sort of, it's, it's, not, it's not benevolent dictatorship, but there is, there is, there's a very clear central leadership, which if you pr produce screws or <laughs> something like that, you know, you need to ensure quality. And there's like, there's just, just nothing democratic about doing the best screw basically. And so there, there's this kind of thing where there's probably a gradient going on where sort of not only in time, but also in size. Like where, 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 where does this transition happen? And obviously misuse and exploitation can happen at any kind of level, but there's probably other cases other than the one you're, you're just mentioning, because also online, you know, there's many, many small apps and uh, with few users and whatever. And if we probably the same primitives won't work, is that true or? Yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, I think these questions about pluralism Mm -hmm. are, are really important you know we mm -hmm. we need we cannot assume and i'm not arguing for that like there is one magic and democratic solution right yeah. it, i mean this is a problem with our with our global political order is right there's this kind of dominant idea that like liberal republicanism is the end of history and mm -hmm. every other government is just like failing until it gets there or mm -hmm. it's it has to be like even authoritarians like pretend that they're in a liberal democracy like they call themselves presidents and which mm -hmm. was like the term that our you know revolutionaries decided as a way to like insult the, the head of state essentially like president was like the worst you know the lowest possible you know title they could imagine um you're just presiding over what's going on um so it's a you know, I, I think it's it's very important to to invite a broad range of strategies and and both up and down the stack and mm -hmm. across um, time. So, for instance, you know, one concept I've worked on is this idea of exit to the community. This is a booklet that we did in our lab. This is like a handbook and a process and a kind of culture all around. Like, how do you develop um, startups that 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 start one way and evolve into more community ownership. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, I talk to founders all the time who are trying to do community ownership. And probably the one thing I stress to them more than anything else is you're still a leader. You know, mm -hmm. the question is not do you, you know, leader or no leader. The question is who are you accountable to at the end of the day? Like when you have to make a really hard decision and slash mm -hmm. your budget, like, who are you going to side with? You know, mm -hmm. that's the question that a lot of this comes down to. And, um, you know, and one essay I'm working on right now is about seasonal governance in DAOs. Um, you know, a lot of these, these new blockchain-based communities are developing these really interesting languages for seasons, epochs, you know, different kinds of like often ecological language for transition. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we're looking at like war chiefs and peace chiefs. And this has a, been a really important practice in, in you know, world history and indigenous cultures and beyond is this idea that like different times call for different kinds of leadership. Some periods might, might call for more like flexible open um, structures. Sometimes where like you're under, you know, urgent threat call for much more, you know, uh, uh, hierarchical top-down um, uh, leadership and you need to be able to cycle among them. So I, you know, I, I think really, I just really want to stress, you know, the goal here in my view is, is pluralism toward 
you know, toward accountability, mm -hmm. um, not any one structure. And and absolutely size, time, culture. There's so many variables. And we, mm -hmm. I, you know, above all to me, the goal is to make sure that our organizations, our communities can evolve the way they need to, rather yeah. than being stuck in these really, really rigid systems. Mm -hmm. um, there's a third question of Hannah. Hannah is our expert in this area, as you may have surmised. Um, so regarding different democratic models, is some of the work related to David Held's models of democracy, there seem to be many of them already in connection to direct or representative, or representative democracy. Um, I confess to being ignorant of David Held's models, but I'm writing that down. I'm a very amateur political okay. theorist. So, <laughs> I can help um, you, but Hannah can uh, <laughs> sort of maybe you can write a, something in the chat very briefly so we can report. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned I have something in mind regarding databases. So I did uh, sort of knowledge graphs before this was called that way. And uh, pre preceding, there was... Uh, relational databases and uh, sort of, you know, sort of object-oriented models where you had inheritance of things. Uh, and so a classic thing would be, uh, you know, like look at your tax form. Everybody fills out the same 1040 with modifications maybe for something, but in general, there is one 1040. And so we all have sort of like these categories, we have to fill them in. So in a similar way, in classic sort of cultural heritage databases, it was a data uh, sheet for object, a data sheet for person or artist, a data sheet for, I don't know, institution and stuff like that. And you could fill that in uh, and you had to fill that in, right? Uh, similarly, um, you know, uh, in, um, in um, a birth certificate, you have, to have, you have to sort of fill in a mother and a father, which, you know, obviously, if one is trans, that's a problem. Uh, so, like, there is this kind of things where uh, where the model, the data sheet, does not work. And so, for example, my simplest example is if you, um, I am the location of my sweater. That 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 is a true statement. If I walk out to the street, that's still true. If I would actually uh, write down the geo coordinate of the sweater, like an actual location data sheet entry, and I walk out the street. The information would be wrong. So, so factually, I would have used the right primitive to fill in the information, but uh, sort of reality would break the database basically. And in some sense, this is sort of something which, um, for me, um, um, conceptually, I, I have a not a, not an issue with, but I, I sort of do data analysis because I do believe that in the data there is a stronger truth than whatever the kind of model people bring to the, uh, to the data model. Basically, if you just watch people uh, collecting data, you will find out more about reality than if sort of like people follow sort of like the primitive that is predefined, which must precede the observation of the world. And so in some sense, this is, I think, is very similar to your primitives uh, discussion, because if you have, as you say, inst uh, um, institutional grammar, which reminds a lot of Christopher Alexander's architectural grammar of like, you know, there's a living room, there's a vestibule, there's a porch, yeah, there's a language. garage and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then you look at a Frank Lloyd Wright house and was like, okay, that's not true. <laughs> So, but it's still an awesome house. So, how do we deal with that? And so, can we allow? They're really hard to live in. <laughs> it's true, but can and we... the water comes in. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true. But can we? Can we? Can we sort of like what would be the process where, at the same time, we have sort of some kind of guidance, so we don't start with a blank slate, where which I agree, like lots of bad things can happen. While at the same time, when it is necessary, we can sort of violate some rules um, and actually create more freedom while non hurt, not hurting anybody, basically. So this, I think, is important because particularly in a liberal individualistic society, you know, you cannot force all people of sort of like, uh, you know, property X to behave like uh, sort of data sheet Y, basically. So, so how do you deal with the flexibility given that you actually run on grammar and inheritance, basically. Yeah, the, I mean, it's a great, it's a great set of issues to bring up. Um, you know, I, I was really motivated to go deep on this governance work, in part, 
by attending the first conference of um, Radical Exchange, which was put on by especially Glenn Weil, who's an economist at Microsoft Research, and you know has de developed some really interesting mechanisms. And there was you know for for voting and things like that. And there was kind of this feeling at this conference, which was a really interesting event. And I you know I tip my hat to to Glenn and his team for that. Um, but there was also this like kind of belief in the room that like if you just get the structure right, governance will be solved, right? And th throughout that conference, I was just making a list of like all the things that people do in the process of self-governance, right? Like handshaking, door knocking, you know, like um, a, a deal making, you know, drinking, you know, I mean, there's just so much like gray area activity that always is part of human self-governance. And, um, and, and it's just vast. And the mechanisms are like, you know, are, are just this like thin superstructure around this like really, really messy human practice. And mm -hmm. I, I've really tried to keep, to foreground that in, in this design work in recognizing that, okay, we can, we're talking about the, the superstructure here. And that really matters because what that superstructure looks like, you know, shapes the possibilities, but, um, but we want to assume a flexible container. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright didn't just design houses. He also designed dresses for the women who would live in the houses. I mean, he was such a totalitarian. And again, like his houses leak, you know, <laughs> they don't work. Um, they're, they're beautiful works of like, but it's like what my kids make, you know, out of toys. Like it's, it's nice, but you couldn't live in it. <laughs> like it's not an actual house. Um, so I, I think we really, really need to to um, to center that sense of like, how do we create things that are livable? And, you know, to compare it to, you know, I think the CRISPR Alexander pattern language approach, which is much more about building things around certain patterns, leaving a lot of cultural flexibility around how you apply those patterns in different contexts, you know, is 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 the way to approach this stuff um, to, to design around the assumption that you're going to have a lot going on that the system isn't going to see. And, and we see that in DAOs right now, like in these crypto contexts where like, okay, you have these things happening that are like supposedly fancy new technology, but often, you know, and this is something I've, I've noticed, like particularly from a feminist labor lens is the sense that there's a lot of invisibilized work that is going on often done by people more likely to be, um, to be non-male gendered, uh, who are who are uh, making the the communities function, while all the credit goes to the to the technical systems. Um, I think there's been a growing recognition of this and a growing like awareness and self, you know, a, a kind of admission that that um, you know that that no DAO is just technical. Um, that mm -hmm. is a socio-technical thing. You know, we, um, my lab just finished a, a booklet. I, I'll share a link to it on um, this idea of sacred stacks. Uh, the, the, the subtitle is The Art of Cyborg Community. And that's drawing on, you know, Donna Haraway's, you know, Cyborg Manifesto, again, a feminist-informed approach that tries to recognize that you need to fuse life and systems. Um, mm -hmm. And anytime you think you're gonna you're going to do away with, the human um, with a technical system, you're probably not doing governance anymore. You're being governed. Um, <laughs> now, now, B, thank you, B, for sharing that that link. You you beat me to it. Um, I I think B, B had, had you had your hand up, but but it wasn't. Uh, it went away, but I think the intent is still there. Is that right? I want to I want to bring you into the conversation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no stress. I I. I don't know. I just I am coming at this from the perspective of someone who also spent some time working in the United States Congress, which is a very governed space. And I think, you know, to Hannah's earlier question around um, kind of it has, you know, what do you say to people who or actually, no, I think actually um person who's sitting next to Maximilian, who I don't yeah. think required it. <laughs> Uh, may have said, what do you say to people who say that democracy, it doesn't work or has failed? And I think that like, there's what Nathan was just speaking to, which is like all of the informal 
sort of un under acknowledged elements of governance play such a major role in governments. Um, and frequently people view that as problematic, like corruption, like if only the people who are governing us were a bunch of like machines who didn't go out to drinks together, or go on golfing trips or whatever it is, uh, then things would be better. But then there's also these realities that frequently like the the political is very personal and um sometimes what it takes to move someone on a particular issue is like literally their family member experiencing a harm that like they had no idea mattered at all until you know until their daughter is gay or until they you know have a rare disease diagnosed in their family or whatever and then suddenly those issues become incredibly salient and so i think that there's this interesting tension that exists where it there there can be a tendency to like wish that it wasn't a bunch of messy humans um and in my work i now work at the aspen institute um on emerging technology issues and a lot of that has meant ai issues as of late and i can't help but feel there's there's this kind of growing sentiment around a lot of people in the ai research space that like aha now we can finally have governance that's, you know, done through this cold and rational, you know, robotic system uh, that that is this AI. Um, and then also a lot of people like reckoning with the terrifying reality of what that might mean, like a system that doesn't care about <laughs> going out to drinks with you or like listening to your problems. And so um, I think that when we ask the question, like, you know, it, does democracy work or is it failing? I think that there's this question of like what gets counted as democracy and where does it start? Like where are the bounds of that thing? Um, because I see a lot of people in my mind kind of like giving up on the humans involved. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel like the humans are in many ways like our, that's our hope. <laughs> like our hope is to work with the humans involved. And so I think that what's really exciting about this space and part of why like I'm not a big person on blockchain, even though it's part of my emerging tech portfolio, but I see blockchain as this fabulous gateway drug into people thinking more explicitly around like, oh, wow, how do decisions actually get made in organizations? And I think that there being more diversity of options to try is a really exciting opportunity for us to like practice almost like a societal uh, oh. mindfulness. A, of a self-awareness of like how do we actually go about living our lives and making decisions as communities and societies um and so i think that like we can't say that democracy doesn't work yet because they, there's still so many things to try mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i uh there is another comment from hannah i have one thing i would like to like sort of like response at here so one of the interesting things i think in the u.s which um having lived on both sides of the atlantic um, what I find wonderful in the U.S., there's so much stuff that happens bottom up that is not organized in a sense of there is a party, uh, there is an institution, there is uh, sort of something that is a governance structure that is imposed, but the governance structure itself may actually sort of like granularly um, sort of emerge. And let me give an example. The supermarket chain Whole Foods had um, a signaling system for fish green orange and red and so basically green meant the fish is frequent you can buy it it's awesome um, um orange was sort of with proceed with caution and red was basically it's actually you know if you eat this the fish is gonna go extinct which you know the whole point about like sort of like this pseudo uh green supermarket chain trying to be uh, sort of conscious about it. That's like that's how he calls it. I think conscious capitalism. So, uh, so they wanted to be conscious about that, but at the same time, they sell you the fish that makes the fish extinct. And uh, so there was this app from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which had nothing to do with that, uh, where they basically also classified fish according to um, you know how much is it uh, endangered or frequent, and what should you eat, and sort of like that. And I realized at some point. That people were standing in front of the 
sort of like a, a fish table at, at Whole Foods, and it would actually get out the app and like check if like sort of the classification is correct. And there was a time about 10 years ago, but like really a lot of people were doing that. And you know, obviously there's the kind of clean tail, which is like an overlap and stuff like that. And so it happened that Whole Foods took the redfish out of the program, partially in reaction to that. Uh, so that basically people were sort of like, you know, they were seeing the resemblance of like checking it out. But then the key thing is, you know, probably now they sell the redfish as orange, but the, the you know, we, we, I don't know if one could trust the, the system, but the key thing nevertheless is sort of something which where I'm from would never happen. I mean, there, there would be something like people would discuss, there would be, uh, you know, discussions um, in, the, in the Green Party or something like that, but it would take a lot of like, it, it would be much more institutional and that kind of like reliance on sort of like some really basic thing, somebody writing an app and like lots of people sort of basically mob using it and then sort of forcing uh, a larger institution, in this case, a supermarket chain to do certain thing. That is not something that you will see in many other places in the same way. And I find that really, really wonderful. And uh, this, this strikes me as something, this is almost like one of these primitives that one could actually sort of enact and try to figure out in what kind of circumstances can that actually be used, where you sort of like, you know, are otherwise completely defenseless against a corporation that has totalitarian control, all the rights of a citizen, but no obligations because it's a corporation, not a person, basically. So, so that is like, I, I would love to see a catalog of these kind of primitives. That would be really cool. Yeah, one project in in um, the government in uh, early in in Medigov was this thing called GovBase, which was an attempt to like catalog at least in online spaces some mm -hmm. of these primitives. Um, we're um, in this project with Wikimedia. We're trying to do this, you know, identify a set of patterns around uh, different like global governance networks. You know, I think this, that, that kind of cataloging project is, is interesting. I, I think there are real limits to any mm -hmm. catalog and, um, and in some ways <laughs> I'm really interested in like the, the territory that's not mapped and not yeah. kind of mappable yet, but it's, um, uh, it's really, I think, important to do that work of identifying what is actually going on. What are the things that people are, are doing in different contexts um, partly when we're designing, so that when we're designing systems, we are working with a broader palette of what needs to be expressible here. So that that's one reason why I'm doing the like governance archaeology project, not really because I'm a historian of political systems. I'm not, mm -hmm. um, but because I know I'm doing design work and I'm I'm informing design work um, that I'm really like interested in trying to make sure that 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 work I have in that work I have in the back of my mind and and my community has before it um you know a set of practices that are really far you know from context far removed from our own um because I think there were a lot of ways in which like implicit feudalism took hold because like in a particular subculture it seemed perfectly cool mm -hmm. and and people weren't asking themselves like oh will my mother's garden club be able to use this right <laughs> or will the you know indigenous community that that we colonized be able to use this mm -hmm. right? and, and um and that's you know those kinds of questions i think are really important you know on the question of colonization right you i think you're referring to whole foods you know which is a company you know that that um you know because of the conscious capitalism reference um that was um you know, the the founder um, started working at a cooperative grocery store and then realized, oh, in order to scale this, I need investor capital. There's no not enough investor capital for cooperative grocery stores. So built it into a company that eventually Amazon would would take over, essentially hijacking the practices of cooperative mm -hmm. communities and um, commercializing them and selling them off to the biggest company in capitalism. Um, so I think it's, you know, that's also something we need to be very concerned yeah. about is, is mm -hmm. in, in learning from a diverse palette of cultures, like, are we actually perpetuating their, you know, their suppression? Um, mm -hmm. You know, Whole Foods has put out of business a lot of cooperative grocery stores. Yeah, um, yeah, or yeah. are we, or are we creating systems that are actually more just and enable um, more kinds of human flourishing to be possible. So that's also 
you know, an important structural question here. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting uh, thing you bring up there. So this is uh, there's another comparison which one could do on both sides of the Atlantic. One is uh, Starbucks, which obviously now is also in Europe. But if you compare that to the Italian bar, where in, in a regular Italian city, you know, something like Starbucks cannot take over more than 10 percent of the market share because um, you know, for if there is a hundred bars, there will be two hundred different people who have two hundred different ways how they use these bars, and and so the democracy is like I go to this bar, I go to that bar, I go to this bar, and therefore you maintain sort of the variety, and that is a really interesting thing, and that is exactly what sort of like was the tragedy of Whole Foods, but then they also kept the iconography in the same way that Starbucks kept the iconography of the sort of like variety of uh, an espresso bar, but it's actually not really the same variety. So that there's a really interesting, like weird uh, sort of thing going on where one actually not only has to look at the, uh, and this is, I think, harks back to your categories, primitives and so on. If you would describe Starbucks using sort of coarse grain primitives, you would not see the difference to a functioning living uh, bar ecosystem in Naples. But if you look at actually where is the difference, then you will see a lot of different things. And it is indeed what, what you say, what is not mapped, what is the interesting part. Samar has a question, but Hanna has a comment regarding uh, held um, in the chat, which is actually going back to this governance archaeology. So Mar, I, I'm, I'm going to read uh, Mar's, uh, Hanna's uh, answer first. So she says, regarding David Held, I've discovered recently um, uh, has characterized models of democracy starting from ancient Greece up to now with various features, for example, asking questions on who is accountable, who is included in legislation, how are rulers chosen, et cetera, categorizing different models. So that's why I was wondering if that was being part uh, of the work, how uh, and how, because there seem to be many models he talks about, but maybe it's more of historical perspective he's focusing on. I'd like to add something to that. So I studied, I had the pleasure to study with um, um, Christian Meyer, who uh, was an ancient historian in Munich, uh, who was a specialist on Attic democracy. And his Attic democracy lecture, which obviously was two semesters or something, emphasized always that Attic democracy has nothing to do with modern democracy, maybe a little bit with Swiss democracy in a tiny town. <laughs> And it was as misogynic. But so the key thing is there is this sort of like really size difference going on. So these different models without knowing what, what Held and I writes up here. So this is sort of something where I think this would be an interesting thing to consider when you say democracy in quotes, right? Uh, there is obviously in the US, this already has a different meaning on the federal level and a different meaning on the, um, are, we, are we thrown out of Zoom here? No. Um, Sorry, my, my screen change. So, so it has a different meaning on the federal level and on the state level and on the local level, on the community level. In Dallas, Fort Worth, where you have 6% um, voting, 6% uh, of the people actually vote, stuff like that. So, so do you deal with these different structures and do you have different meanings of democracy? Could you imagine adopting these different, uh, like playing through your models for all these different versions in history? Yeah, I mean, we've we've generally um, really departed from those classical, like the classical, like Aristotelian formulation of like Aristotle, you know, oligarchy, mm -hmm. monarchy, democracy, you know, these kinds of things. And in, you know, partly because we want to see the complexity at work in any pra practice or system. And so, for instance, in the governance archaeology database, we distinguish between like societies and um, and like uh, institutions within that society, recognizing that they're, they're like, for instance, under Chinese authoritarianism, there's actually a lot of really interesting experiments in participatory practice in politics, like, mm -hmm. you know, jury-based assessments of local governance and, you know, really interesting stuff going on there. Um, and we want to be able to see that. And, and through many, many societies, there is that, there is, there's just a different mix, you know, like, the U.S. has right. You can describe it as a republic, or you can describe it as an oligarchy, depending which lens you look at. Mm. And um, you know, and and you can um, and and you can do that with any society. And so I think we do need to really, um, especially when we're focused on like community self governance rather than like national government, 
it, it, it's, it's much more useful to focus on particular sites of governance, particular what I call like governable spaces, rather than like thinking about the, the system scale, but also recognizing that there is a fractal relate, relationship often between what we do at small scales and what we do at larger scales. And um, yeah, so so I, I'm really interested in looking at this Dave, David Held work around these typologies, because I think it's just really important for us to, to develop languages that invite us not into seeing very rigid labels, but that invite us into experimentation. I think, we're, you know, there are times that ask, you know, like Zora Neale Hurston wrote once, um, you know, there are times that ask questions, or there are years that ask questions, and there are years that answer. And I, I think about that a lot, like that, you know, there are moments that call for us to like protect institutions. There are moments mm -hmm. that call for us to call them into question and to mm -hmm. really broaden the range of possibilities. And I think, I, you know, I feel, I guess, that we are in a moment in our political, you know, evolution and in our tech relationship with these technical systems that we're cyborging with, um, that we just really need more. Um, and a lot of these rigid categorizations are are actually inhibiting our ability to see possibilities for you know democratic possibilities beyond. Um, you know, for instance, that means like thinking about democracy without voting, right? Um, you know, what what other kinds of democratic practice might we have available? Um, thinking about um, about layering structures, about evolving, um, just throwing out some of our categories and creating spaces in which we can ask ourselves ask ourselves again and again what do we actually need mm -hmm. um, i'm going to should, should we turn to mar yes mar go ahead uh hello uh thank you for this uh, inspiring talk um yeah I'm, I'm an artist and well in art spaces also has been um different experiments i guess in in democracy uh, by the way, in your university is a great artist, uh, Mark America, that um, maybe, I don't know if you know him. Uh, I was with him in June and, yeah, and actually has now opened a, an amazing exhibition in Barcelona, which is my hometown, but unfortunately I still didn't visit. I hope to visit uh, in the next month. Um, I, uh, well, I have um, a question. I, I see that in Estonia, for example, they're doing steps to regulate DAOs. Uh, Estonia is always in the forefront in in trying to regulate um, things and and DAOs. I was last year in this NFT Estonia and and also was the Minister of Innovation and the Minister of uh, Finance Economics uh, and and now seems that the, there is like debate of like regulating DAOs and and, and so on. Um, I guess because there are starting already to be a lot of DAOs in Estonia in, in the Web3 ecosystem and there is no, like they, they move in gray area and, and about accountability of what is happening in the DAO is, it is um, some kind of big problem uh, because no one knows what they are accountable and what not. Um, well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert like you, but I mean, maybe you can say if you know some kind of innovative examples of DAOs uh, in terms of governance and, and, and other things that are happening and well maybe I throw two questions and then you can answer one and the other and the other is like well if 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 we you, you said that the, in the web3 is is kind of uh, happening new kind of experiments of like government uh, governance um, if it's DAO is the new panacea of the govern governance so or it's just like uh, something that you are studying just for kind of seeing what, what is emerging in there. What, what was the last question? Uh, I, I, just uh, I mean, what if, I if you I have understand. some innovative examples of DAOs that you can point yeah. out. Um, and the other is that if, if it's the ultimate uh, solution, the DAOs, for kind of uh, like many kind of um, uh, government's problems that can happen, especially with um, not government thing, like, like you said, like more uh, bottom-up um, um, needed of governments, governance, like, I don't know, for example, in the open source, um, or in the, um, even also, you know, there is several uh, artists that they had done their DAO, and now they are controlled by the DAO. Uh, I mean, Jonas Lund from Sweden, and, and also Boto, that is from Maria Klingerman, um, that actually is run by a collector in Madrid, um solo foundation 
uh, that is his kind of like patron in the old style where actually he is kind of buying all his works. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, oh, yeah. just like- No, there's so much there. Um, yeah, like for instance, one DAO that we've been like studying and working with in, in Medigov is uh, uh, Dada, which is an artist DAO um, that also I think has Barcelona roots. Um, and um, Which, you know, how, but how you said is the name of this Dada D A D A. Oh, okay. Um, they were like early NFT um, ah, uh, collective, okay. and um, but but so the um, so so there's so much there, and and I mean first of all, what I think is important about DAOs is that it is a form of you know network native organization, right? So it is important to me in that it is a form of, of, of formal organization that does not depend primarily on the state, um, ultimately police and prisons to enforce its rules. Um, and, um, and, and that's, that's really interesting um, because it allows the possibility of a much wider range of, of options, right? In, in, um, when states license corporations, nonprofits, other kinds of organizations, they tell you, okay, you can do a thing under these conditions. You know, they set the conditions of organization and of recognition. And um, so I think one thing that's very exciting to many of us about what's happening in DAOs is that the floodgates are open. There, there's just, because there the rules are not set about the buckets you have to fall into, um, People are getting to play with the modes of organization in some in some in some ways that we haven't seen before. So, um, you know, there are people in Medica, for instance, like who have developed new voting systems, new uh, ways of structuring an organization that just the world has not seen before, and they have permission to do that kind of because of this this new possibility of creating organizations that are able to handle money resources that aren't in the form that states expect them to be in. Um, that said, you brought up the question of regulation, which is really important. Um, you know, a bunch of us at Medigov just ran a conference at Harvard called Dow Harvard, all about this question about how, how is the state going to see DAOs? And there are a few different, the, the, the kind of big debate um, in that context is how much, um, how much are DAOs going to be folded into, into state structures? So for instance, here in Colorado, we've been doing a lot of experiments that I'm really excited about of incorporating DAOs as cooperatives. And the cooperative structure becomes really important to structuring the culture of the DAO. Um, so we're essentially folding the DAO into a state structure, a state recognized structure, giving it recognition and limited liability and the ability to own things in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but but there's some you know but you know it retains some Taoishness. The the approach being driven more from um, another co-founder of Medigov, Primavera de Filippi, and her community, um, which I think is also very exciting, is they have a a, model, a structure called the Koala Model DAO. Their approach is don't incorporate DAOs, but pass laws where states will recognize. Um, uh, uh, DAOs as legal persons. And so this is more of an approach that assumes not that DAOs are going to become embedded into the system of state governance, but actually are going to be a separate layer with like diplomatic relations <laughs> with, mm -hmm. with, you know, the cops, you know, essentially. And, um, and I think that's really interesting too, you know, is this question of, are we, do we need a layer of governance and a layer of organizational life that is in important respects distinct from, from the, the state. There's some very scary stuff about that, right? But at the same time, at a time where a lot of us are losing our faith in state actors and their regulatory apparatus and, you know, and their trustworthiness, maybe it is a kind of necessary move. And I think that's that's a kind of deep, you know, question that, you know, I'm I'm really starting to get you know, to get obsessed with is like, mm -hmm. you know, are, are we going in that direction? Do we need that, you know, to get the, the kind of creativity that I'm talking about and calling for? Like, can we rely on our territorial states to get that for us? Or do we need 
a new kind of network native social order that has real power that is in, in important ways autonomous from the, you know, from our territorial states, because, you know, maybe, you know, here we are talking across continents, like, why should our territorial states be, be, um, you know, anyway, governing every <laughs> aspect of our, our, of our lives in these ways. So I, you know, I think it's a real, uh, it's a tough, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a, in some ways, a very science fiction question, um, something that like is, is in the realm of artists right now. And I think really important respects, um, but it, it, uh, it is all about this. I mean, it, in Colorado, you talked about examples, you know, for instance, we have a cooperative called, or a, a you know, a conference called ETH Denver um, that's organized through a cooperative DAO, right? And so through that, we've been, you know, this is now one of the biggest cooperatives in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And it's structured as a, you know, it's a DAO and um, it's, it's teaching, you know, thousands and thousands of like computer geeks about co-ownership in this old tradition. And I'm in, in many respects, like obsessed with trying to make those connections, teach like people involved in DAOs about like lessons from cooperatives from a hundred years ago. Um, you know, but at the same time, I keep wondering like, is there, is there something like fundamentally different here that we need to really focus on? And, you know, I'm, I'm torn a little bit. I have uh, two, two questions right now. It's like, and we're, we're, we're ready. We covered a lot of time. So, um, one thing you just said, you say it was a science fiction situation, but I think actually if you go back to your uh, garden club, this becomes very tangible and it's very realistic and already happening. If you, like the neighborhood I lived in was uh, Garland City, Dallas County, Richardson School District. So three things, it was sort of in the overlap of three different government structures. Then uh, there was a homeowners association. We had some sort of commons, like, we, you know, we paid a little money so there was like land that was shared by people. And there was the garden, the community garden. And so if you would think about like, you know, what is responsible, who's responsible, um, what need, you need to think about if you move a tree from one location to the other, what goes into sort of like planting vegetables here, flowers there, uh, all of these things are sort of relevant. But different things were done in different ways. And because you know, the garden club was very much a sort of like bottom, bottom up, democratic, sort of consensus, the enthusiastic people, whatever. They have all the power in a similar way than if you say, hey, I do a DAO, we, 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 have, we generate the expertise and we actually can do things in a world that is sort of like otherwise very stiff and would not allow certain things and, you know, would, would be more awful maybe uh, by just that being there. But then one interesting thing that is that this sort of has to live as a layer among other layers. And so that is, I think, a really interesting thing, which again is a different version of not being blank slate. So the key thing is like whatever you come up with is not is, is a new thing, but I you, you didn't use the word utopia the whole two hours, which is really interesting because an utopia would basically, you know, Thomas Moore, let's do a structure that is completely different than anything we have, and then like that will be awesome, which is obviously, you know, doesn't get more totalitarian. So the key question is, do you like as you come up with these structures, which is a design problem, as you say, as you design them, how about like sensing how to sort of like embed them into the existing layers of what already is there in terms of governance? Yeah, that, um, no, th thanks for that. And that, that. I think that layered approach is, is, is a really useful characteristic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one way I think about the problem of like, nation states today is that we are putting too much pressure on them, right? We're asking them to like solve, you know, inflation and climate change and all these things and like immigration and all the, all these things that like, actually they don't have a lot of power to address because a lot of it is outside their jurisdiction. And so then we like just double down on like perverse nationalism and stuff because like, we just want them to, we want to feel powerful again, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, part of, you know, one way I think about like the challenge of the moment we're in is like, how can we like lighten the load of the layer of the territorial nation state, right? And say, okay, you can have your nation state, but let's just like make it a little less important. You know, let's, and, 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 and have new layers that are better, like not just more like corporations taking over the mm -hmm. world and 
destroying our lives, right? But but rather like better forms of democratic practice in other layers that allow us to work across borders and coordinate and collaborate and 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 address some of these shared problems without having to rely on like the the territorial government. So so recognizing those that that you know there should always be some kind of authority overseeing like territorial spaces, I suspect in some sort of way, but but maybe we need to to put less pressure on them. And, and mm-hmm. that's um you know that that that's a kind of a, a kind of starting point that you know what where you're where you're going leads. Um, but then also in the question of the relationship, um, you know, in that governable spaces paper that's kind of that's part of this book I'm finishing too. Um, you know, again, I argue for a different approach to doing policy. And I, I mean policy both as, you know, technical systems design is policy making in that Lawrence Lessig code is law sense, and you know, making laws in, you know, backed by cops and things like that are is policy as well. Um, I argue for designing policy thinking more around encouraging governability, <laughs> encouraging self-governance in in spaces of where challenges exist. So so a lot of our urge in um in in you know in our country right now is like okay you know we've got um we've got like misinformation and other bad stuff on social platforms. Let's like let's like demand that Mark Zuckerberg solve that problem for us, right? You know, let's make him liable for solving that problem. And Mm -hmm. what that does is it actually just like reinforces his power and reinforces like top-down solution thinking. Um, What Mm -hmm. if instead we said, no, let's, let's actually expect like something like a German co-determination model. Let's, let's expect that any social network has, so has like, democratic spaces designed to solve these problems um, mm-hmm. and encourage that, you know, and encourage users to have the power to solve problems for themselves. You know, let's let's create, you know, courts of adjudication or maybe don't call them courts, you know, spaces, circles where people can come together to solve problems and, um, you know, support forms of, of problem solving based on self-governance rather than based on giving more power to people who are already way too powerful and who are actually like Mark Zuckerberg is actively trying to like relinquish power over moderation by creating things like the oversight board because it's he finds himself in a totally impossible position. Yeah, so, yeah. so to me the you know the 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 key the, there's a wonderful um uh new book by John Rostakis who's a longtime cooperative developer um where he develops this concept of, of the partner state. You know, and the idea here from the perspective of people interested in the commons is this idea of a state that that is organized around encouraging the life of the commons, you know, encouraging self-governance among people and and facilitating those processes mm-hmm. rather than being always the whip that is cracking down and saying no. Um, yeah. and, and I think that kind of orientation is... Um, you know, is is more compatible with building a, a more holistic governance stack, right? In which the state recognizes it cannot solve all these problems. It doesn't just defer those problems to private enterprise. Rather, it assumes that the best way to, you know, the proper way for a democratic state to solve problems is to encourage new forms of democratic participation <laughs> among mm-hmm. its among its citizens. Okay, super. Now I have a second question. This is like sort of maybe the final topic, which is sort of like a, a topic we have uh, avoided uh, in some sense, which is like we're a research group in cultural data analytics, which in some sense, uh, you know, is an artificial word among many for these kind of things. We use computation, quantification, uh, machine learning to extend the usual disciplines and methods that are used to sort of like understand culture, cultural history, art, uh, semiotics, stuff like that. So now here's the question, like uh, you gave us a really, really cool introduction, uh, but there is also a sort of quantitative aspect. And uh, let me introduce this in an interesting way. So um, we have uh, processes where many, many humans uh, interact with each other, 
uh, which have been simulated with agent-based models. People have just looked at it, like, you know, you can take large video camera um, um, frames and look at how people move around on the Hajj in Mecca and actually see when they behave like particles, when they behave like sort of like humans. Uh, so in order to avoid them being killed by other humans, sort of like just walking down the street without bad intentions and stuff like that. So there is uh, the classic fields uh, that deal with that evolutionary game theory and so on have been extended to these sort of like mass models. And then there is also sort of more data science approaches to governance structure and emerging hierarchy and so on. And there, one of the interesting things is you're located at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder, uh, which is also a place uh, where there is two people, Aaron Classet and uh, Dan Larimore, who actually work on the emergence of faculty hiring networks, for example. Like, how is it that, you know, we're surrounded in the US, like not here, but like, you know, there would be a different set of universities that were surrounded by people who uh, sort of did their PhD in MIT, Harvard, Yale, uh, um, Caltech, and that's it. Um, while sort of in places that are one step lower down the hierarchy, you know, there's like people who did their PhD with somebody who did their PhD at MIT and stuff like that. And so there's these kind of things emerging, which utterly resemble things like a Ponzi scheme, basically, you know, is that you have to make your way up the hierarchy, while at the same time, it has been realized in the same crowd of people, Geoffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute, which Aaron Cosette is also affiliated with, that in order to be long lived as a system, you need to have some kind of hierarchy. It's like the human body has these plenty of hierarchies, you know, the bloodstream, the nervous system, the lymphic system, the skeleton itself is a hierarchy. And you need that in order to sustain yourself. And so what Geoffrey West famously said, he said, Google has to become a hierarchy. It cannot be flat, everybody earning 120K and having like, you know, two bosses and that's it. But it needs to have hierarchical structure or it will fail and die pretty soon because any long lived structure needs a hierarchy. Catholic Church is the classic example. So now here's the thing, like we have sort of like, you say counter experiments. And there again, there's a recent result from Santa Fe. Uh, Jessica Flack has this idea of what she calls downward causation. So basically like the example is you have a, a rock with a bunch of monkeys and uh, you know, there is like some kind of dominance hierarchy emerging. And so it basically means like some dominant males and females beating up not so dominant monkeys. And then, uh, the, you know, the one way to enforce the hierarchy is to have every monkey fight against every other monkey. But that's not what's happening. What's actually happening is the monkeys watching the other monkeys fight. And it's like, it seems like only 10% of the fights that would need to happen do actually happen. Um, but the monkeys watch other monkeys sort of like how they react and build a model in their head. And that is sort of like one step up, like there is a sort of shared model. And once that synchronizes, there is no need to fight anymore because sort of like, as long as sort of like, you know, head mama or head papa sort of like still alive, there is no need to sort of like put it into question because everybody knows what the kind of rule is. And so there is a kind of hierarchy emerging, the kind of structure emerging uh, that is bottom up because everybody has to observe and sort of like make up their mind, but then in their mind, it comes top down. There's a kind of rule structure happening. And obviously, you know, this is not a very nice example because it's a dominance hierarchy, but the key thing is these kind of things where, um, you know, if we do bottom up things, these kind of uh, processes of synchronization of agreeing on certain things, which then sort of like, you know, top down sort of like uh, are in agreement. Like we, we we can agree on the human rights. Everybody knows them. And therefore people in public don't kill other people usually. And so, so the question is, how can we actually cultivate what can happen? So we actually are not blindly sort of following sort of qualitative experimentation because there is certainly numerical effects. There is certainly sort of, things that are possible and also things that can be horribly can, can go horribly wrong if we sort of like just try around if that makes sense so the question yeah. is very simple in how much is what you're doing this design process at least that classic design process and in how much is quantification and computation for good 
implemented in that process or do you think it can be implemented in that process so is that something like social computational social science for good uh, for example there's a um a group in in torino we also had uh, as a lab encounter here in the thing they do stuff like that so is yeah. that something that's on the radar is that something you already has have part of metal gov or is that something where you say okay that's something to be desired also we also know you know great caution has to be taken doing that kind of stuff yeah no it, so i i mentioned for instance yeah i keep mentioning seth right i mean uh you, you know my initial work on this stuff like was partly motivated by like trying to respond to his quantitative work mm -hmm. um, and i see it as a cycle you know mm -hmm. I, I i am definitely a very qualitative per i was a reporter before this like my method is like anecdote i am like the ultimate qualitative person you know my dream in life as a teenager teenager was to be a poet you know um so <laughs> i am totally on that boat but what i love about the medic of community is we have people with both orientations and mm -hmm. I see it as cyclical um, in the sense that um, I think, you know, quantitative work is super, super important, um, mm -hmm. but it is really blind if we if we aren't looking at what isn't in the data, you know, which is where I think qualitative thinking is really important. What are we not seeing? And that's, you know, where I think his study on Minecraft, it was it was unable to see the things that, you know, infrastructure was probably driving people toward. Um, and 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 is not able to see the the possibilities that infrastructure is driving people away from, um, and and uh, uh, similarly, like in, you know, in in the book I'm working on, I have a point at kind of the end of the introduction where I argue, you know, this this is not a time to be asking, you know, quantitatively, does democracy work? Because we don't have a foundation upon which to even test it. And so, mm -hmm. in some ways, what I'm what I'm calling for is like, let's build. The laboratory where we could actually run, you know, where we could actually do some tests. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and this question that I, I think um, Mark's question in the chat about reflexivity is really apt to this is, is, is yes, I, um, I think it's, you know, I think the exciting possibility of this moment of having, you know, these, these of doing governance in online space is this possibility of being able to try things to reflect back on them, to be able to to build hierarchies as you as you put it, and then be able to 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 hold them to account, um, to to ask, okay, is this doing what we want it to be doing? Do we need to course correct? Do we need to reorganize um, this structure in some way? Um, and and I think that quantitative work work it becomes very important once we're able to even set goals that mm -hmm. feel accountable. You know, and and you know, I, I see it as my work as to try to like build frameworks in which people feel okay. We we are on the same page. We can trust this system. We can be, you know, this is something that that you know that we can converge around to 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 build those human um, practices and logics. And and once we know what we want, you know, then you know, quantitative tools become really important. And in the meantime, quantitative analysis has been really important in terms of informing, you know, an understanding for me of like, what is the current state of, you know, what are we really dealing with? What are we really working with? How are these online communities actually behaving now? Um, but we cannot become, you know, we cannot treat them, the, the, the status quo as the, the set of all possible worlds. And and so again, that's why I think these interdisciplinary spaces are so important at a time like this, so yeah. that we are constantly, you know, doing this reflexive work of going back and forth between, okay, what is what is, what can the data tell us now that uh, the data that we have right now, for instance, with Seth and I are and and Amy Zhang are doing a, a study of governance MD files in GitHub repos, right? So we're looking at all of the different. Um, you know, governance practices in, you know, in GitHub uh, uh, communities. But, you know, my work on implicit feudalism always is going to raise the question like, well, GitHub is, um, uh, is an implicitly feudal system. So it's constraining. But then our friends at GitHub are actually really excited about us, like implementing, experimenting with them on developing what kinds of tool sets could they allow their communities to have. So then that, that allows a next iteration. Um, so, okay. We're over time. That's it. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much.
Um, yeah, let's close it up. Thank you very much, both Nathan and B. Um, I always Thank you have to so say much for the end, opportunity. I always have to say at the end. Um, so the Kuda and Open Lab seminar will be back. Um, but let's first thank both of you. So thank you very much. I see hands going up. Um, so next week, actually, uh, on April 24, we will have Heli uh, Slovog. My, my Norwegian uh, spelling is very bad. Slovog, um, communication infrastructures, distribution flows, and datafied media industries. And that is the second to last Open Lab seminar. And the one following will actually um, happen basically one week later, which will be Louis Bettencourt. Um, actually, it's two weeks later, Louis Bettencourt from the Monsueto uh, Institute of uh, City uh, Science uh, in Chicago. So there is more media industry next week and uh, city and urban stuff in uh, two weeks. So thank you very much, both of you. And um, this was really great fun and super informative. Thank you very much.